There's two things you just don't discuss in a beer joint, politics and religion. Reason being, these topics tend to be a bit divisive. You add alcohol to the mix and things could get downright ugly, as was the case one sweltering August evening in Newton, Kansas, 1871. Two kind of sort of lawmen by the names of Mike McCluskey and Billy Bailey got into a heated argument over you-know-what, politics. One thing led to another, and the pair took to throwing hands. Wasn't long before both men tumbled out of the Red Front Saloon and commenced to fighting right there in the thoroughfare. By this point, the Ohio-born McCluskey, a former night watchman for the railroad, had the upper hand on Bailey. And, well, I guess he decided to keep it that way. Not leaving anything up to chance, McCluskey pulled his revolver and fired twice, one of the rounds striking Billy in the chest. The wounded man leered, but not for long. The following day, Bill Bailey would make his final pilgrimage through death's door. We'll likely never know the specifics as what Mike and Bill were arguing about, and I guess it doesn't really matter. Just one of the countless drunken saloon killings that took place across the American frontier in the latter part of the 19th century. But what makes this fight so interesting is what would follow. A quest for revenge that led to one of the deadliest and most mysterious gunfights of the Old West. My name's Josh and this is the Wild West Extravaganza. For a very brief period, Newton, Kansas was the end of the Chisholm Trail for the cattle herds coming up out of Texas. And the town seemed to pop up nearly overnight. There's a story of someone passing through Newton in May of 71 and only seeing a couple of buildings. The first train would arrive in July, and by late summer, it was a regular boom town. Now, this was before the Santa Fe line made its way to Wichita, and seeing as how Newton was a good 60 or so miles closer to Texas than Abilene was, it soon became the destination of choice for the trail bosses. Now, the two men I mentioned earlier, McCluskey and Bailey, they were these so-called special policemen hired by the railroad to help keep the peace during a very contentious election taking place that very August there in Newton. And I was unable to find out the exact details of said election other than it had some to do with the railroad or a bond of some sort. Remember, since Newton was a cow town, their entire economy was built around being a hub for the Santa Fe Rail. And this brought a lot of money to the town, especially in the form of all them buckaroos coming up out of Texas who would be more than ready to spend some of their hard-earned money once they sold off their beeves. And one of these young cowpokes was a man by the name of Hugh Anderson, who, unfortunately for Mike McCluskey, considered the recently departed Billy Bailey to be a friend. According to at least one source, the two men were possibly related through Hugh's mama's side of the family. Whatever the connection... Mr. Anderson was outraged to learn that Bailey had been gunned down like a dog in the street. And, well, he decided to even up the score. Speaking of McCluskey, as soon as he terminated Bailey, he got to worrying about having his neck stretched, so he skedaddled. Not for long, though. Once he was assured that the killing would most likely be considered justifiable, he returned. Rumor has it that Billy Bailey had previously killed a couple of guys in various gunfights, so I guess all Mike had to say was that he feared for his life. A defense that, while it may have worked in the court of law, would fall on deaf ears when it came to the Texas cowboy, Hugh Anderson. He and his friends went hunting McCluskey, and they found him, along with a buddy of his named Jim Martin, in a saloon playing cards. Tuttle's Dance Hall, it were, located in what passed for the red light district there in Newton, an area the locals called Hyde Park. And the men in question, those friends of Hugh Anderson, were none other than Jesse Woodson James, Leroy Butch Cassidy, and Paul G.D. Bunyan. And brother, they was looking for blood. And no, that last part is absolutely not true. The actual names of Anderson's friends are names you've probably never heard before. Henry Kearns, Jim Wilkerson, and Billy Garrett. Together with Hugh, they were just four wild-eyed young cowboys. A few of the legion that trailed cattle from Texas to Kansas back in them days. And if it weren't for the events I'm about to describe, it's very likely that all of these men, McCluskey and Anderson included, would be all but forgotten to history, except for maybe appearing on someone's Ancestry.com tree. However, that's not to say they were just a bunch of nobodies. Billy Garrett, in particular, was said to have already come out on top in a couple of shooting scrapes. And Hugh Anderson weren't no slouch either. The son of a rancher, Anderson had very recently rode with none other than John Wesley Harden in pursuit of a wanted killer. And take this next part with a grain of salt, as I was not able to verify it. 
but there is a possibility that Hugh and his older brother had been participants in the Sutton-Taylor feud. What's for certain is that Anderson wasted no time in confronting Mike McCluskey, and he did not mince words when doing so. Called Mike a cowardly son of a bitch to his face and said he was going to blow his dang head off. And this weren't no idle threat either. No sooner were the words out of Hugh's mouth when he cleared leather. But let's just back up for a sec. Remember, this dance hall wouldn't have exactly been empty of civilians when all this went down. There would have been other customers, likely other cowboys, looking to blow off some steam, wet their whistles, and hopefully their carrots. You would have had dance hall employees, a bartender or two, probably a few working gals, maybe even a faro dealer in addition to just a few random citizens of Newton who decided to have a nightcap before calling it a day. But I don't know any of their names. The only other name that I can give you that was there at Tuttle's dance hall at this very crucial point when Hugh Anderson threw down was a teenager by the name of Riley. A longer he was, had tuberculosis. By all accounts, it wasn't looking good. Now, this kid is somewhat of a mystery. <laughs> Scratch that. He's a huge mystery. Nobody seems to know where he came from, and he doesn't appear to have any family or anything like that. Matter of fact, the only thing that Riley did have was a friend, one solitary friend in the whole wide world, a man who had previously been kind to him. And that man was Mike McCluskey. Now, what Mike did to garner the undying loyalty of this Riley character, I have no idea. A few sources will tell you that McCluskey taught the youngster how to handle a firearm, or that he was simply nice to him when others weren't. Whatever the cause, the kid soon became known as McCluskey's shadow. Okay, now we've got all the pieces in place, right? Hopefully you've kind of got an idea of the situation. Hugh Anderson and his pals come hunting for McCluskey looking to get even and find him in a dance hall with Jim Martin and somewhere nearby was the Shadow Riley. Anderson quickly threatens McCluskey and unholsters his revolver and what follows is one of the deadliest gunfights of the Old West. Upon seeing the brandished revolver, Jim Martin jumped to his feet and tried to defuse the situation, but it was just too late. Anderson's pistol barked, and Mike McCluskey took a round to the side of the neck. Still, though, the wounded man was able to pull his own iron, which misfired. Damn it. Mike drops to the floor, and Anderson closes in and pumps several more rounds straight to McCluskey's back. By this point, all hell had broken loose. Hugh's buddies, the aforementioned Garrett, Kearns, and Wilkerson, they started firing as well. At whom, we do not know. One theory is that they opened up just to simply keep the crowd at bay. Likely they couldn't even see what they were shooting at due to all the gun smoke. And they almost certainly had no idea that their most immediate threat lie nearby in the form of a sickly and emaciated teenager who had just witnessed the only friend he had gunned down right before his eyes. Now there's a dramatic version of the story that says Riley then calmly walked to the saloon door and barred it shut for the inside so as not to allow anyone to escape. Sort of like that scene in that movie The Bronx Tell, if you've ever seen it. You know the one. Now you can't leave. Now I personally don't believe Riley locked the door, though. It's a bit, uh, I don't know, theatrical. But what I do think happened, what most people, even historians, agree on, is that as soon as Mike McCluskey was gunned down, this young Riley produced two revolvers of his own and commenced a deal in death. His bullets ripped into Anderson, all of Anderson's friends, and whoever else got the damn way. Even McCluskey's other pal Jim took a fatal round to the throat. By the time the smoke cleared, eight men would lay dead or dying. As for Riley, well, he simply lowered his guns and stepped out into the street, never to be seen again. Ooh, gives me chills just thinking about it. This whole bloody ordeal probably lasted less than 90 seconds, if that. And some unknown teenager just dropped more men in one gunfight than any of your more well-known and celebrated gunmen. Which begs the question, who the hell was this Riley kid? Seriously, nobody knows where he came from or where he went. He just flat out disappeared. And like I said, eight men were shot. Jim Martin, Garrett, an innocent railroad man who took a bullet to the gut, and Mike McCluskey were all dead. Anderson was shot twice in the legs, and his buddies Kearns and Wilkerson were wounded as well, along with another innocent bystander. And each one of these casualties were due to the lethal guns of Riley, except for Mike McCluskey, of course. As for Anderson, he would survive his wounds, but he was facing serious legal troubles. A warrant was issued for his arrest on account of gunning down McCluskey, 
But Hugh was snuck out of town and back into the safe beckoning arms of the Lone Star State before he could be brought to justice. And like I said, Riley just disappeared. And that, in a nutshell, is the shootout at Hyde Park, also known as the Newton Massacre. But trust me, the story is far from over. Look, if you're like me, then you were probably at least a little familiar with this fight already. I mean, I've been reading some version of it for as long as I can remember. And for the most part, the story is pretty consistent, and it's pretty similar to what I just described, especially with the strong emphasis on this young man, Riley. I always wondered, though, you know, could there be more to the tale? What would I find if I dug just a little deeper? Luckily, I was not disappointed. I also didn't have to go digging all that deep. Turns out somebody had done quite a bit of research on our behalf, and that someone is a lady named Christine Schmucker, the curator for the Harvey County Historical Museum there in Newton. More on Chris later, I just wanted to point out that her work was phenomenal. But first, let's address the fake elephant in the room. You go ahead and Google the Newton Massacre or the shootout at Hyde Park, and you're sure to find another exciting tale of revenge. One that would take place a couple of years after the gunplay I just described. Story goes that Mike McCluskey had a brother. And if there's one thing brothers don't care for, it's someone else murdering their sibling. I got a brother too, okay? And if he needs killing, I'll be the one to do it. Allegedly. Not some rando. And I reckon Mike's brother, Arthur, felt the same way. Remember, Hugh Anderson was safely whisked back to Texas following that shootout. But according to this version of events I'm about to recount, he would soon find himself back in Kansas, Medicine Lodge to be exact, working as a bartender. And as soon as Arthur McCluskey found out, he sent an emissary on over to formally invite Anderson to a duel. Yeah, a proper duel. This wasn't going to be no wild free-for-all like the one Mike died in or Billy Bailey, for that matter. Now, this would be a stand-in-the-street affair with rules and such. Anderson was even given a choice, pistols or knives, and he chose pistols. I can't blame him there. Both men stood back-to-back, walked several paces away, and then, at the signal of a pistol shot, whirled and began firing at each other. And both men drew blood. Matter of fact, they both emptied their damn revolvers. And although both were horribly wounded, neither one was willing to call it quits. According to one dubious reporter who claimed to have witnessed the fight, quote, McCluskey, summoning by a supreme effort his remaining strength, drew his knife and began to crawl feebly in the direction of his antagonist. The latter, who had raised himself to a sitting position, saw the movement and prepared to meet it, end quote. What followed was a good old hack fest with the gruesome duo slicing and stabbing until finally, with the last flicker of a blade, both Hugh Anderson and Art McCluskey lay still in the street, deader in hell. At least, to quote Mike Rowe, that's the way I heard it. Kind of. I mean, there are a few sources that are willing to admit that maybe Hugh Anderson actually survived his wounds and once again returned to Texas and lived to be an old man. And they admit that because, well, it's true. And we know it's true because there's one hell of a clear paper trail when it comes to Hugh Anderson. Listen, I love a good fight to the death as much as the next man, believe me. But here at the Wild West extravaganza, we try to focus on true tales from the Wild and Wooly West. As such, I do at least attempt to separate fact from fiction when I can. And it turns out this is one situation where I definitely can do so. Once again, largely due to the research of Christine Schmucker, who we'll get to later. As far as that fatal duel there at Medicine Lodge, there's one source and one source only. And that source is a shady AF news correspondent that went by the alias of Allegro. Yes, Allegro. Sounds like some sort of over-the-counter allergy medication or something. Common side effects of Allegro include nausea, diarrhea, upset stomach, muscle or back discomfort or pain, sleepiness, drowsiness, erectile dysfunction, anal bleeding, anal fissures, anal warts, anal anything, a propensity to listen to horrible podcasts. Please consult your physician. You get the drift. And when it comes to this Allegro guy, let me tell you, the dude knew how to spin a tail. He had also reported on the gunfight at Hyde Park back in 1871, and he was the one that dubbed Riley as the avenging nemesis. Matter of fact, let me read you that passage so you can get an idea of what sort of flair that this Allegro guy wrote with. In August of 1871, very shortly after the actual gunfight at Newton, he wrote, quote, There is an avenging nemesis on track. A stalwart figure suddenly appears on the scene. For an instant, he remains motionless, as if studying the situation. Then a sheet of flame vomits forth, apparently from his hand. 
and a Texan staggers from the room across the area and falls dead at the door of the Alamo. Another and another and another shot follows until six men have bowed to his prowess. End quote. So here's the deal. This Allegro, in addition to being a correspondent to various newspapers, also made a living as a fiddle player there in Kansas dance halls. At least he did before getting run out of the territory. He would soon, however, continue to write salacious stories for a rag dubbed the New York World, but even they got tired of him, fired him and doxed him, saying that his true identity was, quote, a shyster named E.J. Harrington, who was utterly unworthy of confidence and continence and belonged in the penitentiary, end quote. And it is this man, this quote unquote shyster, who is our only source when it comes to the duel at Medicine Lodge. Now, before you get to But Josh and me is not just this bad reputation of Allegro, who was also referred, by the way, uh, in the Newton papers as a deadbeat that makes me question the validity of the duel. Now, some people point to the location of this alleged fight as being proof positive that the story was fake. Allegro says it took place in Medicine Lodge, which he described as being, quote, in the very heart of the Indian nation, about 100 miles south of the Kansas frontier, end quote. Now, you and me know that Medicine Lodge was, in fact, in Kansas and not in the Indian nation or Indian territory. But I am of the opinion that this could possibly be explained away just by the awkward phrasing. To a greenhorn like Legro, everything outside of the city limits there in Kansas was the Indian nation. And I mean, in one sense, he could be right. You know, you had a lot of Arapaho and Southern Cheyenne, Kiowa, and even your occasional Comanche out there. Furthermore, the town of Medicine Lodge which was founded in 1873, the year the duel allegedly took place, was only 25 miles north of official Indian territory, and coincidentally about 100 miles southwest of Newton. So Allegro's uh, description of being 100 miles south of the Kansas frontier can easily be explained, in my opinion. Now, the main issue with this story, to me, is that there's zero corroboration. Allegro claimed that he and about 70 others witnessed McCluskey and Anderson fight to the death. Yet there's no proof that anyone anywhere at this time, nor in the years that followed, ever mentioned it. Matter of fact, the local papers there in Kansas were already calling the story a lie almost as soon as it was printed. And furthermore, we know the ultimate outcome of the duel, the death of Hugh Anderson, is absolutely not true. Here's where the paper trail comes into play that I mentioned earlier. You know, thanks to census and marriage records, as well as family recollections, we've got a pretty good general overview of Anderson's entire life. He was born in November of 1851, by the way. So he was still just 19 years old when he threw down on Mike McCluskey there in that dance hall. Rash and full of piss and vinegar and probably thinking he can live forever. Just like a thousand other young men you can still find to this day in dance halls scattered from Houston to Midland. Full of fake courage and meanness, especially come payday. Not to say that Anderson wasn't from tough stock. As I mentioned previously, his daddy was a rancher and veteran of the Civil War, having served in the Shiloh Home Guard in DeWitt County. And as I previously teased, the family may have been involved in the Sutton-Taylor feud. And while I could find no solid proof of that, I did find some pretty good evidence that our young Hugh Anderson did in fact know John Wesley Harden. Now that's an interesting story all on its own. In early July of 1871, a Baccaro by the name of Juan Badina shot and killed Billy Coran, trail boss. This led some wealthy cattlemen to recruit none other than the notorious Wes Harden to track this Badina character down. According to the book Ten Deadly Texans, Harden ran into Billy's brother John as well as a young cowboy named, you guessed it, Hugh Anderson. And together this bunch was able to locate Mr. Juan Badina at Sumner City, about 60 miles south of Newton, on July 7th. And once located, John Wesley Harden's pistols barked and another Juan bit the dust. Get it? Another Juan? One? Eh, whatever. Anyway, the gunfight there at Hyde Park would occur just about a month and a half later. And it does seem that this may have been Hugh Anderson's scared straight moment. Remember, he was still a teenager himself. That's another weird angle to this whole story. There's so much emphasis placed on the youth of Riley, who we're going to get to in a minute. But many of the sources I've seen list Riley as being 18 years old. However, when it comes to Hugh Anderson, we automatically imagine a grown man with plenty of experience under his belt. And that could not be further from the truth. And yeah, you know, John Wesley Harden would have only been about 18 years old himself in 1871, but I do think he was just built different. Some men, most men, don't have the stomach for such deadly action. 
PTSD is real, and most of us just want to live our lives peacefully. Hardin, however, was a bit of an anomaly. A pure killer who didn't seem to fear death nor have any respect for the sanctity of life. He'd continue his violent ways for the next 20 years, whereas Anderson seemed to steer clear of trouble after gunning down McCluskey. Once back in Texas, Hugh would get married at the young age of 20 after recuperating from his wounds. And his first son was born in 1873, the same year when he was supposed to be up there in Kansas fighting Art McCluskey to the death. By the way, I'm no detective, but uh, I would like to point out that I was not able to find an Arthur McCluskey anywhere near Kansas in the 1860s, 70s, or 80s. Now take that for what it is. I'm not saying it's definitive proof that the man didn't exist, but I am saying that the proof isn't readily available for a dummy like me to find. Back to Hugh Anderson. His wife would die sometime in the 1870s, and by 1880, the widower is living in McCulloch County, Texas, working as a stock raiser, a career he would continue even after his second marriage in 1884, as he and his new bride relocated to New Mexico couple would have two daughters, but unfortunately, Hugh Anderson would find himself a two-time widower by the year 1900. A decade later, in 1910, Hugh was still alive and well there in New Mexico, now living with his grown son Oscar and his family, and still working as a stockman. In mid-June of 1914, old Hugh, now 60-something years old, took refuge under a tree during a rainstorm. The tree was struck by lightning, and that was the end of Hugh Anderson who the local paper dubbed a well-known cattleman. He's buried over in Tenney, New Mexico, by the way, just outside of Lincoln. And as far as anybody knows, he never once mentioned no duel up in Medicine Lodge. Hugh's younger brother, Wyatt, who lived all the way up to 1948, would later describe that cattle drive that took place back in 1871. Now, Wyatt would have only been five or six at the time, but he does confirm hearing that Hugh did kill a man in Kansas that summer and that their older brother, Richmond, also had a couple of killing scrapes, one in Texas and one in Kansas. And yeah, just like his brother, Wyatt Anderson likewise never mentioned any second duel with uh, Arthur McCluskey. I think it's safe to say that that duel never happened. Not only was the man who penned the original article an untrustworthy source, but there's also zero evidence, and you gotta have evidence. As far as the mysterious Riley goes, oh boy, where to start? Look, your guess is as good as mine. The biggest question I initially had was whether or not Riley even existed. I mean, there are some obvious holes in the story, right? There was a coroner's jury formed following the shootout to determine whether or not Hugh Anderson murdered Mike McCluskey. And shortly thereafter, a warrant was issued for Anderson's arrest. And it turned out to be quite the exciting affair. Remember, young Hugh Anderson wasn't in town alone. He was with a group of half-wild cowpokes who weren't too happy about the findings of that coroner's jury. Matter of fact, they promised that bodies would soon be hanging like ornaments from telegraph poles if Hugh was arrested. Anderson's father, Walter, then 50 years old, wasted no time in getting to Newton and not only securing the best medical care for his boy, but also appealing to the business leaders there in town to help get his son out. For their part, they wanted to avoid any additional bloodshed, so a plan was soon concocted to spirit the wounded cowboy out in the dark of night. The excitement was intense, recalled Newton resident, Judge Robert W.P. Muse, going on to say, quote, And the city marshal Tom Carson and his assistants, all heavily armed, were parading the streets day and night with warrants for the arrest of Anderson, end quote. Once the local sawbones decided that Hugh could be safely moved, And with the help of the aforementioned judge, the young man was placed on a train at about 2 a.m. Thus ends the third or fourth chapter in Newton's bloody history, a town only a little over three months old. But if the worst and beastly prostitution of the sexes is continued and the town is controlled by characters who have no regard for virtue, decency, or honor, it will not soon become fit for the abode of respectable people, reported the Abilene Chronicle on August 24, 1871. So yeah, there you go. You know, a lot was written about Hugh Anderson directly following the shootout, but there's barely a mention of this mysterious shadow, Riley. The correspondent Allegro didn't even mention Riley by name. Remember? Only referring to the shooter as the quote-unquote avenging nemesis. Matter of fact, it is this Judge Muse who seems to be the first to name the kid, saying, quote, A friend of McCluskey, a boy named Riley, some 18 years of age, quiet and inoffensive in deportment, and evidently dying from consumption, end quote. He'd go on to recall that Riley was known locally as McCluskey's shadow, 
and that he was a, quote, thin, tubercular man who followed the railroad gunman around like a little dog that barked and snapped from behind his master, end quote. Judge Mews, who, while a citizen of Newton, wasn't actually present at the dance hall on the night in question, was also the one that theorized that Riley coolly locked the door of that saloon before drawing his revolvers. A poem published a year after the incident also lists Riley by name. And this poem, penned by Theodore F. Price, reads as follows. What form strides o'er the threshold red, with weapons fiercely clenched? He looks upon McCluskey dead, with gory garments drenched. Then calmly aimed, the trigger drew, a Texan died, his aim was true. Seven gory forms before him lying, that friend was fearfully avenged. Grim Riley turned away. I don't know. You would think there would at least be more said of this Riley guy. Why was there no warrant issue for his arrest? Or if there was, why no mention of it? Nor mention of the deputies walking the streets of Newton searching for him as opposed to Anderson. There was all this excitement about Hugh leaving town in the middle of the night and he only killed one man, whereas Riley took down several. In 1950, nearly eight decades after the gunfight, a newspaper there in Newton quoted an unnamed prominent citizen as saying, quote, Law-abiding men knew what had taken place in Tuttle Saloon. They furnished the youth Riley with saddle and bridle. A livery stable owner gave him a pony, and he rode out of town that night and wound up in Ellsworth. Nothing more is heard of him, and it is presumed that his pulmonary disease ended his life. Skip ahead another 20 years, and in 1971, an author named William Moran wrote in his book, Santa Fe and the Chisholm Trail in Newton, that he thought Riley could have escaped town the next morning, possibly as a stowaway and, you know, simply changed his name. And according to another author, Mary Sandoz, uh, she wrote in her book, The Cattleman, that there was a posse formed to look for Riley, but, of course, they never found him. Ugh, so few details, so many questions. I suppose, though, that it's not that surprising that the good citizens of Newton would likely want Riley out of town as quickly as possible. You know, you and me, we look back at these stories, and they're exciting, right? Cowboys and gamblers and shootouts, frontier towns. But to the people living there in Newton, you know, the majority of them were law-abiding citizens. Normal people, shopkeeps and merchants and hotel operators and barbers and stuff like that. Family men. They didn't like crime any more than you and I do. We know that, according to Judge Muse, they were more than willing to help Anderson get out of town if it meant no more killing. Likely as not, they were equally as willing to sneak young Riley, if that was his name, out of town as well. Probably hoping he'd never come back. And surely they would have never dreamed me and you'd be talking about them 150 years later. And don't call me Shirley. But man, you know, I sure wish I knew who Riley was. Driving me crazy. And for what it's worth, there are theories, but unfortunately none of them hold much water. One that really picked my interest is that the young man wasn't really consumptive, and that he not only survived his escape from Newton, but lived for many, many more years. Under the alias of Doc Middleton. Now, if you're not familiar with Doc, whose real name, by the way, was Jim Riley, he was one hell of a horse thief. He was also described as being a very thin, soft-spoken man, which would line up with Judge Muse's description of the Newton Riley. Middleton was born in 1851, so his age would have fit as well, and then there's the fact that Doc wasn't afraid to resort to violence, having already killed a man by the tender age of 18, a killing that landed his ass in Huntsville Prison. Now, he would eventually escape, but here's the thing. Not until 1874. Our gunfight at Hyde Park took place in 1871, when Doc was still behind bars. So unless I've got my facts wrong here, I think it's safe to say that Doc Riley Middleton is not R. Riley. By the way, it's thought that Doc earned that title by the way he could doctor or alter a horse's brand. I'll have to look more into Middleton one of these days. He might just be a future topic here on the Wild West Extravaganza. All right, so here's what we're left with in the end. Gunfight at Newton most certainly took place. Eight men were shot, four of whom died. We know Hugh Anderson opened up the ball and that it's likely his bullets that did McCluskey in. As for the mysterious shooter Riley, who the hell knows? Well, I don't believe that he locked the doors of the saloon, I do think there's enough evidence to conclude that he not only existed, but that he was also present and a participant in the gunfight at Hyde Park. As to how many of the wounded and dead he accounted for, as opposed to Anderson's friends who also opened up fire, I don't know. And as far as what happened to Riley after the shootout, I doubt any of us will ever know. It's my opinion that in cases like this, it's almost always the simplest answer 
It turns out to be true. Occam's razor, right? I tend to think that Riley probably did have tuberculosis and that he was probably already on death's door when he shut them smoke wagons there in Tuttle's dance hall. More than likely, the young man fled town and he didn't survive another cold Kansas winter. Just another kid buried in a pauper's grave somewhere, probably under a damn Starbucks now. And once again, as far as the duel at Medicine Lodge, I think we can safely say that was a figment of Allegro's imagination. There's only one recorded telling of the story pinned under an assumed name by an untrustworthy source. A source reported as a liar, even at that time. And in the years that followed, there have absolutely been no other pieces of evidence backing up these claims. Either way, the whole ordeal is fascinating. The gunfight in Newton didn't involve anyone famous, and none of the participants could be considered as real deal gunslingers. Yet the result was a body count higher than most of the more well-known shootouts. The OK Corral, for example, I think there were, what, three wounded and three dead? Now, I mentioned Chris Schmucker earlier, the curator for the Harvey County Historical Museum there in Newton, Kansas. Her research and articles proved to be invaluable to me while preparing this episode. I always knew there was more to the story, and sure enough, thanks to Ms. Schmucker, my suspicions were validated. She has posted a series of articles on the museum's website that I'll link to in this episode's show notes. Lots of good, well-researched information on Hugh Anderson, as well as the mysterious Allegro, gunfighting question, and that duel that probably never happened. I highly recommend you checking out her stuff for further reading. Like I said, link in this episode's show notes. Chris, if you're listening, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hard work like yours really helps an idiot like me to sound like I actually know what I'm talking about. And if your bosses are listening, tell them I said to give you a raise. By the way, Newton celebrated its official 150th birthday recently, on February 22nd. But I'm told that the festivities will continue throughout the year. The next big shebang there in Newton is scheduled for June 4th. So, you know, if you're in the area, please stop by and check it out. And email me and let me know how it goes. And that is about all I've got on the Newton Massacre. Okay, so on to an unrelated topic. This here is going to be one of those full disclosure kind of things. I was contacted a while back by a lady who works for the INSP network. Now, I was not previously aware of this channel because I haven't had cable or satellite TV in years, but there's a good chance maybe you're familiar with them. Looks like INSP plays a lot of older westerns like Bonanza and Gunsmoke, as well as some modern day stuff like that Mountain Men show. I was checking out their website and they play some pretty good movies as well, including one of my favorites, Open Range. INSP also has original documentaries or docudramas, which is what I'm about to discuss. One in particular that just premiered is called Into the Wild Frontier. Now, let me stress this is not a paid advertisement. By the way, if you're ever wondering if something is a paid advertisement, I don't know this for sure, but I think I'm like, uh, I think I'm legally obligated to tell you. So, yeah, this is not a paid advertisement. INSP contacted me, offered me a sneak preview, and asked for a review. When I replied that I'd love to share my thoughts so long as they were okay with me giving my honest opinion, they said that's exactly what they were looking for and that they, INSP, value viewer feedback. That said, this is a little bit late. This all happened a couple of months ago, and you know I've been a busy little beaver. I finally had an opportunity to sit down and watch the episode that they sent me, so I figured I'd go ahead and give you my hot take. This episode in question, which I believe has now already aired, is on the great mountain man Jim Bridger. And for the most part, it's about what you'd expect from a docudrama, right? You've got a narrator, some reenactors, a panel of experts that chime in on occasion. And other than a few historical liberties that I felt were taken during the reenactments, I thought it was pretty good. My only real gripe was that I felt like the bulk of the episode was more focused on Hugh Glass than Jim Bridger. And Jim Bridger's life was so epic. I mean, this dude was really like the ultimate mountain man, as well as one of the more respected. And he was still out there, still scouting on the prairie well into his 60s. Tough, tough dude who led one hell of an exciting life. And unfortunately, most of that was not really touched on on this episode. However, in defense of INSP, or in defense of Into the Wild Frontier, this episode in question is titled Jim Bridger Forged on the Frontier. So I'm hoping this was just an introduction to the man and that there's going to be more episodes to come, you know, highlighting the other aspects of his very long and storied career. And if that's the case, then, hey, I thought they did a great job. 
They explain how Jim was a young man in St. Louis working as an apprentice blacksmith, how he joined up with Ashley's fur trapping expedition. They talk about that big fight with the Rickera, all that good stuff. So here's hoping there are more episodes on the great Jim Bridger. And in all fairness, you'd be hard pressed to sum the man's entire life up in just one hour. I mean, hell, that's why I've been putting off doing an episode on him for so long. So yeah, all in all, while not groundbreaking, I did think it was worth watching. Per the INSP website, Into the Wild Frontiers described as follows. Early pioneers, scouts, hunters, and traders fulfill America's destiny to expand westward, exploring uncharted territory to blaze new trails. While dangers of deadly predators, starvation, bad weather, and unwelcoming Native Americans linger around every corner. The promise of land and the opportunity pushed brave men like Daniel Boone, Kit Carson, and John Coulter to keep going. Within the epic adventures and survival of the early settlers lies the origins of Western lore and the creation of legends that live on forever. There you go, right up our alley, right? Apparently, they've already released episodes on Lewis and Clark, Jim Beckwith, and John Coulter. All subjects I absolutely love talking and hearing about. And if I did have cable TV and or the free time to actually sit down and watch it, I think I'd most definitely do so. By the way, the panel of experts included a familiar name, one I've mentioned several times on this very podcast, Stephen Ranella of Meat Eater fame. He, just like me and you, has a real passion for that old mountain man air, so it was good hearing him chime in. And unlike me, Ranella not only has firsthand experience with getting up close and personal with an angry grizz, but he's also intimately familiar with the fur trapping process. Okay, so that was my remarkably unremarkable review of Into the Wild Frontier. Give it a look. I mean, honestly, what the hell else are you going to watch? I actually googled the current top trending TV shows, and wow. My, how the mighty have fallen. Do yourself a favor and turn off whatever reality show you were going to watch and give Into the Wild Frontier a chance instead. I would like to thank INSP for giving me the sneak preview. And if you're listening and looking for someone to make an appearance or offer up some insight on a particular topic, maybe even do a little bit of writing for you, well, you know how to contact me. I'm both cheap and easy. All right. I know I promised the Alfred Packer Colorado Cannibal episode this week, but I lied. I'm still working on it, man. It's going to be a long one, and it's already taking up way too much time as it is. I got this problem where when something is starting to feel like work as opposed to play, I don't want to do it no more. And when I spend too much time on one topic, it starts feeling like work. So while I am going to finish the Packer episode, I can't say for certain when it will be released. Maybe next episode, maybe in a couple of months. What else we got? Oh, I get asked from time to time for book recommendations. So I decided to make an Amazon list of all the books I've ever mentioned on this podcast. I made a few lists, actually. Uh, If you go on over to my website and click on the shop option on the navigation bar, you'll see what I'm talking about. Or you can click on the link that I'll leave here in the show notes. I have separate lists for fiction and nonfiction books, as well as a third option for books that I personally found impactful or just highly entertaining that, you know, don't really have anything to do with Old West history. There's a fourth list labeled as gear. I added that sort of as an afterthought because... I also have people inquiring as to what microphone or whatever they should get for their own podcasts. So that there is just a reference of the gear that I currently or have previously used while making this here monstrosity. Now, the links for these books are Amazon affiliate links. All that really means is that should you buy one of them after clicking on said link, I think I get a small percentage. Doesn't cost you anything extra, though. Big shout out to Kyle and R. David, who were very generous to donate to the cause via Buy Me a Coffee. Thank you so much for your support of the podcast, and thank you to all my patrons who continue to do so as well. Thanks to everyone for the very kind emails and comments that have been rolling in lately. Always very much appreciated. Oh, and before I forget, you can now email me directly at josh at wildwestextra.com. My old emails, Bloody Beaver Podcast at uh, Gmail and Wild West Extra at Gmail, those are still available too if you don't want to bother switching over. But hey, daddy's trying to sound more professional. And as always, you can just go on over to my website, wildwestextra.com, and just simply click that contact button. Let me know what's on your mind. And please, if you like what you hear, share this podcast with somebody. Help spread the word. That is, hands down, the best thing you could do to support the Wild West extravaganza. All right, that's about all the jabbering I'm going to do today. Try not to get into political arguments with anybody. 
I know it's hard to do this day and age, but let's face it. You're not going to change anybody's mind, and there's always a chance things can get ugly, just like they did there in Newton. Try not to catch tuberculosis either, or go on a drunken shooting rampage. All right, till next time, adios.